Welcome to Lansdale Presbyterian Church Sunday School. This is the first class in a series titled The Meaning of Suffering. Our teacher is Dr. Bill Edgar. Dr. Edgar teaches apologetics at Westminster Theological Seminary. And Dr. Edgar is going to help us look at what the Bible has to say about suffering. And this perhaps is especially poignant given the situation we find ourselves in with COVID-19. Uh, just a note that the recording starts a few minutes into the class. It was a factory where they made machines and tools and uh, guns and all that for the Nazis. And uh, because of his expertise, um, he was kept from the death camp. But he 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 became, after the war, he became uh, one of the best I think writers, one of the most articulate uh, writers, you know, you don't have to be a good writer to uh, be effective in, as a survivor. And there are a few others, uh, Elie Wiesel and others, but I particularly uh, am moved by his, his novels and his stories. He wrote a documentary called, if this is a man, and it's a, it's the story of his life in what he calls the logger, which was the technical word for the camp. And uh, it's, of course, it's harrowing, and uh, the way they treat people is just beyond description. But he, he reports, this is a, probably the most famous incident in, in the book, that one day he was really thirsty, and uh, he, he saw it was very cold, and he saw an icicle on the window, uh, reached out for it, started to suck on it to get some water, and the guard grabbed the icicle from him, and uh, crushed it on the floor with his foot. And Levy said to the guard, why? And the guard said, here there is no why. Here is kein warum. And um, that's one of the uh, biggest questions surrounding what we call the Holocaust. The better word is Shoah. Um, why? Are there any answers at all? And so many survivors came to the conclusion there were not. Uh, others came to the conclusion God had abandoned them or never existed. And it, it's one of the puzzles of um, the, the 20th century life. And we're going to unpack that a little bit and try to give not exact clear answers as to why this experience, but to put it in a setting where at least there's some explanation for there's some meaning for it. Johnny Erickson Tada is a great heroine of, for many of us. And um, you know her story. And many of us have been involved uh, with her in friendship and even in her work. When she was, I think, 18 or 19 years old, she, uh, she was very athletic. And she, they lived in the Chesapeake Bay area. And she dove off a pier and hit a rock and broke her back. She broke her neck, the C4 which made her a paraplegic for life. And um, the first few weeks, if not months, of her experience, she comes from a Christian family. She, she asked why. What on earth could be the purpose of this? Um, now, unlike Primo Levi, um, the rest of her life, as we will see, has been um, wonderfully driven uh, by purpose, not just for her, but for thousands of people that she's helped but she had that, she asked the question, um, and it was a surprise. You know, you don't expect this to happen to you. You expect tragedy to happen to others, but not to you or to your own family. And I think it's a legitimate, it's an, a legitimate question. Uh, we're, if we ask why, we're in good company. Uh, the psalmists regularly ask why. And many of the prophets as well, certainly our, our friend uh, Job. And some tragedies are explicable. You drink too much, you'll get cirrhosis of the liver. You, you're promiscuous and you can get a venereal disease or whatever it might be. But some su suffering just seems to make zero sense. Um, a little child gets leukemia. Why? And we want to ask God, and it 
the first thing to say is it's very legitimate to do so. Um, unlike other religions, the Christian faith does not have a God who says, just figure it out. Now, of course, as we'll see, there's a lot of false answers out, out there to the question of why. You know, there's the pros prosperity gospel folks. And um, it, that's an affliction that's not just in Africa and Latin America, but we find it in North America. And basically the message of the prosperity gospel is God doesn't want you to suffer. If you're suffering, it's because you don't have enough faith. Push this button. Try this approach. Believe in him more. Uh, get yourself into, work yourself up into a frenzy, and, and you will be prosperous. And, of course, uh, the Bible rails against such false promises. And uh, they're not only false, but they're, they're cruel. And then um, on the opposite end, you have people who are kind of determinists. Uh, just live with it. Uh, if you want reasons, you're making idols. Uh, deal. And that's just as bad as the prosperity gospel, because God doesn't have us deal you won't find a verse in scripture that says, buck up, pull up your bootstraps, and uh, face it. Uh, you'll have something very, very different. And that's what I want to say now. And then I'll, I'll say it, and then we'll pause for some questions. The Bible's perhaps surprising answer is that God knows. I think my favorite character in the Bible other than Jesus is Job. And I've spoken to you about him before. I'm dying to meet him in heaven. Job 23, where he is suffering horrendously for reasons that make no sense to him and, and that only make a bit of sense to us because we know the bigger picture. He says, uh, behold, I go forward, but he's not there. I go backwards, but I don't perceive him. On the left hand where he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. And then verse 10, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Now, Job's faith needed to be further developed, uh, as, we'll, as we'll see in a minute. But that's the answer, friends, <laughs> to the problem of suffering. God knows. Now, this is not just a leap of faith. It's not just fatalism, uh, que sera, sera. Um, it's the, the most wonderful assurance because the God who knows did not spare his own son, but experienced the suffering firsthand um, that someone abandoned by God more than will ever be had to go through in order um, to reach out to us. Now, to be sure, he doesn't always give us the answers we'd like. Why this baby, you know, has leukemia, um, why the Shoah, but he, he says he knows. Not only does he know, but he is uh, in control of all things. And this God who's in control is a God of love. Now, that's not comfortable. That's not comforting to many people who have been so afflicted that they've ceased to believe that God could be a God of love. And um, for sure, it can be said in such a way that it is just a pious language. But if you look carefully at the Bible, God's love is manifested all over the place. And while we legitimately have questions about why suffer, we can have great comfort that God knows what God, well, the God of love. What love? Uh, the love of the suffering of Jesus Christ. Somebody once said that Christianity is the only religion whose God has wounds. That's a profound statement. Um, we don't have a God who is aloof, who is far away, but one who has become deeply involved in our lives and in our suffering. To be sure, he's angry with us. To be sure, he's a God of justice. To be sure, he will not let sin go unpunished. At the same time, he has devised this remarkable plan for saving his people um, from their sin and their guilt. And in the bargain, he gives us 
hope in the midst of our suffering. Now, the strange part about this is that uh, suffering is a part of his pruning, of his sanctifying process, which has many purposes. I've come to be skeptical about silver lining theologies. I know that there can be a silver lining to all things. There's a silver lining to the coronavirus. You know, here we are all together, forced into fellowship. That You know, there you can always look for that. But as, a, as an explanation for God's dark providences, it's quite hopeless. Uh, could not God have achieved his purposes without a Holocaust or a child dying of leukemia? And where's the silver lining in six million Jews um, who, who died under the barbarity of the Nazis? I mean, you can try to force it, but it's, it's just not there. It's, it's a cruel statement. One of the typical answers to the problem of suffering, and again, it, it has its virtues, but I've come to be very skeptical about, is through the image of the tapestry. Uh, you know how you look at one side and it's a, it's a mess, and then you turn it over and it's a beautiful picture. And the tapestry image is meant to say, we see the mess, but God sees the beautiful picture, and there will be a day when we'll see the beautiful picture when we get to heaven. Um, I say yes and no. <laughs> there, there are, um, you know, of course, relations between a, a beautiful ending and the messiness of life, which God orchestrates. But to tell that to, you know, a, a person in an in inordinate suffering, or just to give that as a philosophy of life, uh, could God not have achieved his purposes without the mess? I think it's, it's just an inadequate comfort. No, the only, the only real comfort is that this God, who knows the way that I take, will, when he tries us, make us come out as gold. Not because we're good, not because we can endure, but because we put our trust in Jesus Christ, who um, suffered inordinately for us. The most um, harrowing words ever spoken from earth to heaven were Jesus' words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, He's quoting Psalm 22, but he's living it. And, um, Heaven is silent for him, and great darkness covered the earth. Now, he did rise from the dead gloriously three days later, but we need to grasp the depths of his um, participation in our suffering, taking our place so that we would not have to have a silent heaven when we ask those questions. But we know that we have a God who knows. So... um, let me just pause there. I see there's a couple of people on chat, and maybe, JJ, yeah. you could host that for us. Yeah, we got a couple questions. Just a really quick, backing up to the uh, death camp, the, um, the guard had said, here there is no why, here yeah. there is what? No, just I'd said it in German. Uh, Kein warum. That'll please your dad. So what's, what's the whole phrase? That's it. Here, there is no why here. In other words, oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah, you're a prisoner. I can do what I want. Um, you could ask questions, but they don't have any answers because we don't provide them in a death camp. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other question is: Can you give some examples of people not fully grasping that we live in a fallen world, and why is that? I think most of us. Uh, I would certainly be included, <clears throat> do not fully grasp that we're in a fallen world. And so we are surprised by suffering. Um, you know, let me give you an example from uh, popular culture out there, and I think some Christians get caught up in this. Um, there's a lot of talk on the media, some of it helpful, some of it not. And much of it is saying, We'll get through this. We have the technology. Listen to smart people. Do what they say, um, and it it won't last. Well, that's very well-meaning. But very few of these are saying, 
this thing is really bad. And um, there aren't any uh, immediate answers for it. Uh, we may get some in months ahead. Uh, but it's a denial of the reality of, of the fall. Um, you know, there have been pandemics before in human history. In the 14th century, uh, there was a great bubonic plague. And um, it decimated a third of the population of Europe, and it was just dreadful. However, people lived in a theocentric universe, and they, they realized that whatever else this was, God was involved. Now, some thought they could put their finger on where God was judging and why things have gone wrong. Surely these plagues are a judgment. But I think we have to be very careful not to say, oh, it's because, you know, of, I don't know, immorality or something like that. It, it, surely there's a relationship, but unless we have a, a prophet with us, we, we, we don't know. But we, we do know that um, God may be judging our arrogance to think we can go along with a healthy stock market, uh, live the way we want, um, not ask the deep questions. And when we do, like our friend Sachs, find ourselves without the equipment to answer them and expect no consequences. So I don't know. I don't know why God is allowing this virus. I, I'm sure there's elements of judgment in it and purging and cleansing. But it's surprising. You're going along and everything's going well. Well, not everything. But we think it is. Uh, you know, the news keeps saying af after the longest period of American prosperity, boom, we're back to the depression. As though this were something utterly shocking. Now, I, I'm not a determinist. I don't believe in case or And I, I also don't believe in I told you to, so. But I think we get surprised when we are living our lives relatively comfortably and something slashes across the screen uh, with horrendous tragedy. I'm not saying we should relish it or expect it, um, let alone hope for it, but um, it, it should not be an utter surprise to us. One of the things I admire most about pastors like Tom and others who are on the front lines is that when they comfort people, they don't have to say, you know, it's nothing. Uh, it'll go away. Um, just pray. No, they, they enter in with full compassion. Um, and um, they say, look, this thing is just tragic. We're weeping with you. Uh, we, we, um, we don't believe that God wants this for you, ultimately. Um, however, here are a few pointers to how to cope with it. Um, so that, that's a long-winded answer to the, to the very good question. Why, why are some Christians surprised? Um, it's because we, uh, we don't fully grasp the radical nature of the fall of man. All right, I've got another question. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about the distinction between God using suffering for good as opposed to suffering being quote, good. Oh, yeah, that's an excellent, wonderful question. Romans 5, uh, as you know, which begins with there is no condemnation, praises God for our access to him through Jesus Christ, and then adds the caveat, this has to happen through suffering. And then he gives a few reasons for the suffering. Uh, it helps with perseverance, it builds character, and ultimately gives us hope, a hope that doesn't put us to shame. Now, without having all the answers, some of the good reasons ordained by God for suffering is to prune us so that we hope, not in earthly things, not in doctors, though we, I love doctors, saved my life, um, but in um, his gospel which is shed abroad in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So there are lots of good reasons. Sometimes we can see them, sometimes we can't, for suffering. The passage from 1 Peter is actually a beautiful place in Scripture, uh, which associates suffering with fellowship with Christ. 
mysteriously, but marvelously, uh, when we suffer, we are somehow joined to Jesus in a way that we would not have been if we weren't suffering. Now, this is very careful to say that there's a red line that we mustn't cross, which is, therefore, suffering is good. Uh, Therefore, um, suffering is redemptive. Uh, And there are lots of theologies and religions which say something like that. Um, Suffering is a good thing. I call it masochism. But some theologies call it the only answer to uh, the need for sanctification. And they even say that God could not have accomplished his plans without suffering somewhere. We, we don't know that. We do know that when it does occur, and it has in, in the setting of a fallen world manifested itself, he then, because of his love, uses it for his glory and for our good. But that's not a reason to say, gosh, suffering must be a good thing in itself. That's, a, that's very foreign to the Bible. Um, never does the Bible say, gosh, Suffering is a great thing. Uh, let it come. It's, uh, it says suffering is real. It, it, it happens, but it's terrible, and uh, God will get us through it. I don't know if that helps. Bill? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Phil. Um, Hi, Phil. Thank you for your, uh, your teaching this morning. I, I have to admit I'm a little unsettled by something you said. Go ahead. Maybe you could clarify. Uh, it sounded like, and maybe I misunderstood, but it sounded like you were saying, uh, there can be God's judgment without us really understanding what that is. Do you mean we, we don't understand specifically what it's for, where we can understand generally uh, the, the nature of judgment and sin? Could yeah, you- that's exactly what I mean. Um, when the Twin Towers were attacked, some preachers said, oh, it's because of homosexuals in our culture. That's what God is just telling us that's wrong. Well, in general, God disapproves of homosexuality, And in general, we should expect judgment living in a culture where we think anything goes. But to blame the Twin Towers on that particular sin, I think, takes takes a step too far. Uh, So that's what I meant by saying we we don't always know. We we can put two and two together sometimes, but it's very dangerous to say, well, here's what God is doing, and if you stop doing it, it won't happen anymore. So that's my my point. Yes, there has to be a relation, but we can't always tell where the finger of God is pointing. You know, like, here's an example from history. In the first part of the Civil War, the South, and I'm a Southerner, its preachers said that God is on our side, we're going to win, slavery uh, can be tolerated, the Northerners are aggressors. And then by the middle of the war, when it wasn't going so well, they began to say, I wonder if we're doing something wrong. And I wonder if slavery really isn't such a good thing. And they began to uh, look very, very hard at the condition of slavery. Now, there's lots going on, and David Brewer can help me on this, but it, it, it's, it's right to say the war has something to do with judgment, but it's wrong to guess that this might be because he's on your side. Um, and... Uh, now, he may give us the realization that there's problems, which he does through war. But uh, to say that the, the finger of God is here and I know it, I've got it, I've, I've uh, you know, I've got the umen and thummim and I'm a prophet. Uh, no, you don't, you just don't want to do that. Does that make sense, Phil? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I got another question for you, Bill. Um, some people let their suffering define them and stay in their suffering instead of seeking to learn through it? How can we encourage people to move beyond their suffering with God's grace? Well, that's, again, a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, We've all known people in life who have basically defined their lives with suffering. And at one level, it's hard to blame them. You know, here's Johnny Erickson in a wheelchair for her whole life. But it becomes unhealthy, to say the least, uh, if not obsessive, to literally define your life uh, by a particular kind of suffering. I'm not going to mention any names, but there's 
one one missionary who tragically lost a a family member uh, in an attempt to do missions, mm-hmm. and um, for the rest of her life, she defined her herself by this loss. Now I'm not going to make judgments. She's a wonderful person, but I think there's something unhelpful or unhealthy about um, defining everything in terms of this one great loss. Now, how do you get past it? Um, it's through. Uh, maybe this is a good way to transition to uh, to our friend Job. It's through the experience that Job had. He could easily have defined his life by suffering. He had every human right to, afflicted at every side. And uh, and then at the end of the book, you know, we all would have hoped God would say, you poor guy, I'm sorry I had to do this to you. Uh, let's move on. And God doesn't do anything of the kind. He admonishes him rather severely, lovingly but severely. Um, and he reminds him that he's in charge. And he tells Job, uh, in so many words that you weren't around when I was creating, and so you don't know what's going on. And Job very humbly says, I had heard of you, but now I see you, and I repent in dust and ashes. He realized that his God was too small. Now, in the end, he's, he's right, and, and his friends are wrong, and, and there's lots of positive, but he had to go through this... Um, Somehow this realization that God really does know what he's doing, and we, we dare not say the end of the question is me hurting. Uh, it's tempting. I, you know, I've been there myself. Uh, but what you're doing when you're saying that, you're saying God's not really in charge, and he can't mean anything good about it. And as I said at the beginning, the Bible, without giving us all the answers, does say that God's intentions are good. He who did not spare his only son, how shall he not give us all things? So I think the way to answer your question directly, to get past defining your life by suffering and into um, another place is to begin to see more clearly who God is, what kind of God we have, um, what's his track record, how he deals with people. Um, Painful process. you, You remember the one of the Narnia stories, um, I think it's Voyage of the Dawn Treader, where um, Eustace is a despicable character, and he, out of his greed, he turns into a dragon. And um, he's, it's a big handicap. He begins to realize that dragons can help, and he, he's, he's on his way to changing. But then um, on the beach, he meets Christ, the lion, and who rips off the scales one by one from him. It's extremely painful. But suddenly he becomes, you know, a good person. And I think that's often what has to happen to us. Um, if there was any other way, the book of Hebrews said, God would have found it. Um, he was talking about a law. But if there is any other way besides suffering, God, God will, will, will find it. We're not, uh, and I say this having been through it a lot myself, we're not as bad off as we might think we are. In our prayer group that that Vern leads, we have a marvelous Indian fellow. We were praying for the poor and the destitute who are the worst victims of this virus. And he said there's a people group in northern India called the rat eaters. Sorry to be so gross in the morning, but um, these people are so poor. They're poorer than the Dalits. Um, And they, they, all they can eat is, is rats. Now I sometimes feel poor uh, because, um, I don't know, the, I get a bill that I can't afford or uh, somebody gets angry at me. But I, I, don't, I don't have to eat rats. So sometimes, my mother used to say this, and it used to really annoy me. Uh, think of how much worse it could be, you know, and I, I don't like that kind of view. But there's something to it. Um, we are not as bad off as we could be, and we need to count our blessings. But much more than that, Count on the God who gives us these blessings and learn about him and learn about his ways and learn to trust him uh, through the suffering and to see that we don't need to know the whys and wherefores, the varums, in order to trust him. 
So I hope that's a helpful reflection. That's all the questions I have at the moment. Okay. So let's, um, let me uh, come to uh, the, the final point here. Um, and that is related to what I just said. Uh, we will not really uh, alleviate our suffering until we've had a change of heart. In other words, the problem isn't God. The problem is us. That's what Pogo used to say. And um, I want to refer us to a powerful story in the New Testament, which we all know. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, um, to his passion, and uh, he confronts or is confronted by ten lepers. Um, Leprosy in uh, the Bible, it's a term that covers a number of skin diseases. And today we have uh, cures for, for most of them. But in those days, uh, there, was, there were just little known little cures. And among other things, lepers, because their disease showed, had to be um, isolated. Uh, or maybe they didn't have to be, but they were. They were quarantined like us. And uh, so they're leper colonies and you, you can get a sense of this if you ever see Ben-Hur, uh, the cave where uh, the mother is um, condemned because of her leprosy. So it's a disease that is both real and metaphorical, a bit like cancer. It's real, all too real. But it's also um, metaphorical. Cancer gets penetrates us like sin. And leprosy is a sign that, you know, something's wrong. Now, unlike all kinds of cancer, leprosy is there for everybody to see. So you, there's shame. And uh, it was just terrible to be a leper in, in New Testament times. Um, that's why they uh, grouped together and uh, were isolated and so forth. Well, you know the story, of course. They, um, they had heard about Jesus and his amazing gift for healing, and they, they met him. And they asked him for mercy. And his strange words were, uh, go and see the priest. Um, strange because you don't you expect him to wave a wand and say, okay, you're, you're, you're well. Uh, actually, going and seeing a priest was an Old Testament injunction. Uh, the priests weren't necessarily medical doctors, but they were the ones that uh, handled uh, some issues of, of disease and uh, uncleanness and and so forth. And once you were uh, a leper, and often if you could be cured of it, you needed to go to the Levite and have the Levite um, pronounce some words over you. And and so it was the right, that was exactly the right thing to do. So they, they say, okay. So they start marching and suddenly they're healed. And that's the amazing part of the story, but the the really amazing part of the story is that only one of them, who happened to be a Samaritan, a hated outsider, saw what had happened, turned around, bowed down before Jesus, and gave glory to God. He, he got it. He saw it. He he realized this is not just medical healing. This is only God could do this, and he he praised him for his love. And then Jesus asks the hard question, where are the nine? And I don't know the answer to that. Maybe they were like the elder brother, which comes just a few verses before. Hardened in heart to all that God was and is, regardless of what they perceive to be circumstances. Perhaps they just thought, well, this is, you know, we're in the crisis in the religion business, and that's what professionals do. Um, I don't know. It's it's an affliction which I think some of us suffer from when we assume God is in the saving business. Uh, and we assume that, you know, be, because plan A didn't work in the garden, he just went to plan B. And no, um, salvation and God's help is a mercy. As the Russian theologian Florovsky put it, it's an everlasting surprise. Um, it's not a surprise to God, but it's a surprise to us that uh, we are such terrible sinners caught in our sin and our diseases that he would do anything, uh, let alone 
completely save us and heal us. And um, this Samaritan saw it. Um, sometimes outsiders see it better than insiders. It's not always the case. Um, I became a Christian at 19, some of you know, and I was a, a complete outsider. We didn't have this in our family. And I was so delighted to encounter the faith that I overdid it, was zealous, offended people. Uh, you know what happens. Um, but I was in a place where there were lots of other people who were being helped, um, many of which had come from Christian families. And about 90% of them were just mature, wonderful people who were just being helped. And I was actually, to be honest, I was envious of them. I'd wasted 19 years of my life, and uh, they, they were so far ahead. And I wish I you know, had their Bible knowledge, their prayer habits, and so forth. But there was a small percentage that um, grew up feeling uh, resentful towards God, towards the authority of the Christian faith. Um, they knew the Bible inside and out, but it wasn't alive for them. And they, they rebelled. And uh, thankfully, one of the reasons they were at Labrie, which is the place, um, is that they were trying to get answers. And uh, the Schaefers had wonderful answers for rebellious Christians. So I don't know where the other nine were. Were they from, you know, oppressive Christian backgrounds? I don't know. Well, Jewish backgrounds. But the Bible, uh, on every page almost, um, emphasizes the difference between the people who, as it were, get it and the people who are uh, imprisoned in their coldness and lack of compassion. Uh, you can think of Jonah. Um, he didn't want to go to Nineveh because he didn't want to see these people saved. You think, oh, what a terrible man. Well, are we better? Because when some weird person shows up in our path, we think, gosh, get out of the way, or we can help you, but just change your clothes, or I don't know, whatever it is. So, um, but the Bible also doesn't leave it there. It tells us there's a way to become grateful. It's not in our natures. By natures, we are of the devil, we're cold. And one of the ways to become grateful is to uh, practice the means of grace. It's not an automatic, you know, thing like, like a vending machine. But if we listen to Scripture regularly and hear it expounded, if we have fellowship with other believers, if we pray, that's such a big one. God does not answer like a, you know, the Coke coming out of the vending machine, but he is um, happy uh, to come and visit us. If we knock, he will open. Um, that's not the only way, because he sometimes just, like the Apostle Paul, he just <laughs> intrudes and invades and crosses his path and opens his eyes. And, um, you know, that, that happens to some people. But uh, you can cultivate humbly a warmness uh, to the gospel. But the greatest way to do it is, of course, to look at, to meditate on, inwardly digest the work and the words of Christ. Read through the New Testament over and over again. Read through the Psalms and pray through them. And realize that the people who can respond warmly are those to whom God has already reached out warmly. And if we begin to understand the gratuitous nature of God's love, our cold hearts can begin to be warmed to his, um, his grace. And we can begin to be like the Samaritan and, and bow down and say, thanks be to God. So um, I, this is not a short formulaic answer to the problem of suffering, but it's a path we want to take. We, we, we all know suffering. Some of us, you know, more than others. Um, but we want to begin to say, God knows. And this kind of, this God is the God of love. And we want to then deepen our knowledge of him by looking at Jesus. Um, it's a lifelong pursuit. 
indeed, it will last for eternity uh, because it's his love is completely unfathomable. But we can begin to get glimpses of it and have to, our cold hearts uh, warmed, strangely warmed, as Wesley put it. Okay, I see some people wanting to chat, JJ. Yeah, no more direct questions. Okay. But if anybody, if you want to, you know, if anybody wants to speak up with a question, maybe we can do that before we close. Uh, here's one. Would you say that life and wellness are a privilege, a gift from our creator, and this should move us to gratitude? I would. It's not an automatic one. <clears throat> if we don't have it, we shouldn't say, well, we're missing something. Uh, but it's definitely a privilege rather than a right. Um, that's some of the, I think, confusion of the modern world is mm-hmm. we've turned everything into rights instead of privileges. And, um, you know, I understand that human rights has a distant Christian origin, but it so easily spills over into, you know, um, this is my right. I don't know if you watch TV. We watch too much of it with this disease, but there's a series of ads uh, about if, if you've taken this medicine and it made you sick, you, you, you may deserve compensation. And it says, you know, call this lawyer. Of course, it doesn't say how much he's costing, but it says uh, call this lawyer and find out because you need to get everything you deserve. I don't think they realize how scary that is. <laughs> if, I, if I get everything I deserve, I'm on my way to you know where. Now, I, I'm not meaning to belittle human rights, you know, and advocacy, but uh, I, I agree with whoever asked this that uh, wellness, when we have it, is a remarkable privilege, which is a gift of God, one that we must not fail to thank him for, um, and one which we must not squander. All right, we have another question. Uh, It says, do you agree with the quote, quote, outside of hell is pure grace? I don't think I know what it means. Can you you tell me what that means? I don't want to embarrass the person, but I don't don't think I know. Is it just saying there's two places to go, heaven and hell? That's for sure. Um, But outside of hell, today, uh, there are people that are, you know, mixed in with the wheat and the tares, and and, uh, we don't know whether they're going to hell or not. Um, And so we just don't want to say it's all grace. I I just don't know. I'm sorry. I just don't know what the question means. Well, the person added, um, while still on earth, we are still blessed. Yeah, it's a blessing to be alive. Like the Apostle Paul, we should be in a dilemma. Is it better to go and be with Christ or to stay and do some good on earth? And as you know, he said it's a whole lot better to be with Christ, but I'm going to stay on earth because I have a job to be done. So while we're on earth, uh, there's a lot of homework to do. And uh, um, and yet, uh, uh, the sooner we get to heaven, the better. Bill, this is Brian Hand. I think I can clarify. It, the, the question is asking, because we are sinners and deserving of hell, anything short of being in hell presently is a measure of grace. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, there's a doctrine in the Reformed faith called common grace, uh, which boiled down says that whatever your condition whatever your intentions, wherever you're going, the fact that you're alive and are able to do some good is, is not chance. It's, it's, it's the grace of God. Uh, and we need to give him credit for that. So, yeah, if you're not in hell and you're on earth, in that sense, um, it's, it's a measure of grace. If, if, I think that's a good, um, good thing to say. Uh, we have to be really careful here not to say, well, therefore... Life is easier, therefore um, we can handle any problem. Or, you know, but um, it, it's it's always gracious to be alive in a fallen world. That's the nature of the covenant. Okay, I've got another one. Um, 
Would suffering be one of the greatest catalysts for sanctification uh, without being masochist? Yes, I, I want to say it carefully, but I think that's right. Um, suffering is never purposeless. Uh, and it's often the thing God has to do to get our attention. C.S. Lewis called it the megaphone. In other words, God has to speak loudly to us, and sometimes the only way is because of suffering. I can give uh, a testimony of that in, from my own life. You know, I'm, I have a reasonably balanced theology. But when I got my heart attack, I began to realize I might have been taking some things for granted. Um, uh, I always knew intellectually we were on a thin thread. But boy, being in the um, ER and then the IC ICU for weeks, you know you're on a thin thread. Um, and uh, I don't know whether God could have gotten through to me in another way, but he sure chose that way to get through to me. Now, am I now... Uh, perfect and well no, just ask Barbara. But um, I, I do think I have a better sense of um, the privileges of life and the work we have to do and the shortness of our time. And uh, yeah, God used this way to do it. Is it the greatest way? I don't know, but it is certainly a great way to get through to someone like me. I could share just a brief testimony similar to what you're talking about, Bill. A yes. few key times in my life where I've gone through some things. And one of the outcomes for me, of course, by grace, is that um, I've, I was able to see idols that I was putting my hope in. Yeah. And um, so. Yeah, that's helpful. You know, there's a very, very good book by Timothy Keller um, on walking through suffering with God. And he's got a couple of chapters on idolatry. And it's not what you think. It's not, you know, you silly man, you're trusting the wrong thing. But it does very uh, tactfully say that sometimes suffering comes in order to point us to the idols that we don't even know we have. You know, uh, well, I, there's so many examples of that. But if you lose something or, you you know, you lose your money or you lose your house or you lose heaven forbid, your CD collection. Um, God may be pointing you gently to a prop, um, you know, that, that you've, you don't realize, but you've depended on it. Does that mean we should get rid of our possessions? No, of course not. We don't, that's not our job. God's job is to know when and when not to uh, take things away. Um, but, uh, yeah, thanks for that, JJ. And I think we all have areas where um, unwittingly we've we've turned something good. That's what an idol is, usually, something good into an absolute. Yeah. I, I'll give you just a quick example. When I went through all my digestion problems before yes. I had the surgery, yes. and I pretty much couldn't eat for six months, I realized how much food can be an I idol. I know. Um, just those kinds of simple things to get you through the day. Here's a question. What's the difference between suffering and the trials mentioned in James or are they synonymous? Yeah. Uh, most of the time they're synonymous uh, for Christians. They're almost always synonymous that um, God allows you to have trials in order to uh, sanctify you. Now Christians aren't the only ones who suffer. Uh, unbelievers, of course, suffer, and sometimes just as much or worse. Um, the purpose for them might be slightly different. It's related, but different. Um, God is getting their attention, like the megaphone. Um, there may be uh, chastisement. You know, um, uh, this is, I don't want to take any cheap shots, but, um, you know, the, the AIDS and virus wouldn't have occurred without unfaithfulness. Uh, I don't want to point fingers at people because, you know, pregnant ladies who haven't done anything wrong can get AIDS. But there's some obvious connections. And for unbelievers, that the suffering um, may be a way um, to, to, to get their attention. It may be a judgment. The great comfort, and we'll get to this eventually in the next couple of weeks, is that 
There is a day coming when all the books will be balanced and God will perfectly execute his judgments. Um, In the case of believers, we're acquitted because of Christ, which doesn't mean he won't chide us for sins that we've committed and we don't have to give account of our life. It does, but um, he, it's only chastisement based on um, things we could have done better. In the case of unbelievers, um, sadly, tragically, it's going to be um, the revelation of those things which they knew and transgressed anyway. I think back to our first question, surprised by suffering, I think it's possible that many non-Christians are surprised because they don't think they've done anything that wrong. Uh, they, nobody feels they're perfect, but, you know, they've given their money away. They've been nice. They haven't beat their wife or husband. Um, but God is going to reveal at a, at a very deep level how uh, that the transgression is not just um, superficial, but it's uh, knowing God and refusing to give him thanks, as Paul says. Um, it's going to be a hard day, but the most wonderful day, because you would not want a a world without justice. You would not want a world in which evil gets to go unchecked. Um, uh, And we we won't have that. But God is patiently waiting for us and take advantage of that time to uh, to grow in him. Bill, I have a question uh, that maybe you don't have much time to answer, but... um, I feel like you know a lot of people are suffering these days in, in a lot of different ways, health and, and finances and everything. And that the church uh, is used to responding to suffering in certain ways, but in, in a way we're we're being asked not to respond in those ways. And so, um, do you have any thoughts on on what we can be doing to respond like today and, and going forward and, and things like that? Yeah, I, I have a bunch of thoughts. Yes, you can take 15 seconds. <laughs> That's okay. Um, well, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this in the fourth week, but just for a preview, um, there are all kinds of ways in which the church can respond without breaking the rules about distancing. Well, there's a couple of churches up our street uh, where they give free food to people um, and that's that's very mundane, but, you know, there's people starving out there. Um, there's also appeals to uh, evangelize um, a- as we give help, which can actually be done uh, through all kinds of means that don't require personal contact. Uh, look, let me finish with a story. Um, I think I've used this before, but, um, you know, in the, the Roman Empire uh, was powerful beyond imagination. It had the most powerful army. It had a judicial system which was pretty good. Um, it was based on uh, a military dictatorship, which at time was benevolent. And yet the one thing it was powerless to confront was, of all things, a pandemic. There was a series of plagues early on called the Galen epidemics. And um, people got afflicted by uh, something like the plague, and the Romans were completely powerless to do anything about it. Um, they had a few hospitals which were made, which were for noble people and military people, but the hospitals were just a waiting station to, before death. Uh, for most people, they put them on ash heaps and just, uh, just tried to get rid of them. This little Christian church, handful of people, had something that the Romans didn't remotely know about. It had three things. Um, first, it had a meaning structure in which to put a pandemic. It didn't say why, you know, this century has this plague, but it knew that evil was expected, like we've been, we've been saying. Um, second, they had something the Romans didn't cultivate, which is a fellowship of people who came from very different backgrounds, but were there for one another. Um, we're, we're absolutely... Uh, dedicated to to one another. And third, they had compassion on the victims. And often they would go, we can't do this, but they would go to the ash heaps, pick up the dying 
bodies, bring them home, die themselves, and um, and yet almost overnight with the church's actions, this this pandemic went away. I think today there's equivalence to that. I think we can find um, parallels. How what it was, what it's going to look like? I d- I don't know for sure. Our son-in-law has got is involved in a company called Hope Ventures, which helps Haitians to to learn uh, to deal with basic uh, survival. Um, I think the church needs to be there. Um, this is a great opportunity for Christians. Um, it, it'll, it might cost us, but uh, it, it's something we don't want to miss. And then as the churches in New York discovered, after it's all over, um, really only those churches that preach the gospel and help people, really help them during the World Trade um, disaster were ones that continued to, to be filled. And we'd like to say that about our churches, that we're not just bringing a rescue, but we're bringing help, which will encourage people to stay and, um, and, and be part of it. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Uh, we're, we're at 1030, so I'm thinking probably need to uh, end the class officially. So what we've been doing, maybe you can close us in prayer, but we yeah. can certainly stay on longer for people to share and talk. Sure. Let's pray together, friends. Um, oh, Lord, our God, we bow before you in your majesty, in the wonder of who you are in your love and in your judgments. And we we want to say with Job, you know the way we take. Help us, if we don't have this faith, um, to, to develop it. We believe, help our unbelief. And thank you for this opportunity as a fellowship. Thank you for uh, all that you're doing in Lansdale, uh, through the leadership, through the dear devoted people. We pray that you would give us um, inspiration um, along Phil's question to to know how we can help others sacrificially. And um, we also pray that you would abolish our props and idols so that we may be devoted only to you, even though it may cost us a great deal. We dare to pray these things, um, knowing that you love us and that nothing can take us away from that love. No one can wrench us out of the arms of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.